I quit may be the smartest two words you ever say. I'll tell you why in this lesson. Hey buckaroos, welcome back to Music Com Academy where you learn how to become a radio program director. This is gonna be a different kind of lesson. Um, it's not really, I'm, I'm not really gonna teach you something. What I'm gonna do is what I really want to do for the brunt of this course is to teach you how to think. And I don't mean like, hey, you must think this way. I mean to open yourself up that, hey, nothing is cast in stone and you really need to think about things differently, to look at things in an entirely different way and to question things. And that's where I quit comes into being. You know, and that comes up in a lot of different ways. You know, one of the ways certainly is, okay, this job sucks. I'm out of here. I quit, you know, which a ton of people actually, because of COVID, are doing right now. I mean, there's some sort of like an epidemic of people quitting. And, uh, you know, it may not be a bad thing ultimately for them because the job market is such at the moment where people need people. So if you ever want to change jobs, now's the time because there's a shortage of workers. So you can better yourself. It's kind of smart to quit and just move on. But this isn't about quitting your job. This whole thing is going to be about business. And then certainly I will absolutely turn it to radio specifically because what brought this up to me, as I think it would be really good to talk about, is there was a Larry Rosen article in Radio Inc. Larry Rosen is the president of Edison Research. And Edison Research, as they do research for a million different things, they what they did was they went back and... They took 2011 to 2021 and compared the major formats of radio, how they were then and how they are now, the ratings, you know, how they're doing, and, and then put it in a chart of what you're seeing right now. So, you know, here's the article and this is what it is. And there's be a link below to the Radio Inc. article where you can read it. And Larry goes into it a little bit um, because probably, you know, here's the, here's the data. What's actually causing this is up in the air, certainly, and we'll talk about that as I get to the radio section in this. But if you just do a quick skim over this, you're like, wow, in the last 10 years, classic rock has jumped 30%. Contemporary Christian radio stations have jumped 49%. Uh, news talk, up 8%. And no, you know, with COVID, with the elections and things, you know, Trump and all that stuff, I mean, that sort of makes sense. I mean, that's sort of obvious. Some of these are not so obvious. Spanish contemporary. 17% up. But now look at the bottom. Pop contemporary hit radio and rhythmic contemporary hit radio down 33% and 53% respectively. Actually, rhythmic contemporary hit radio has dropped more than half in the last 10 years. And you got to go, man, what's with that? Why is that? We're going to talk about that. And, uh, you know, I'm going to go through some things you should be thinking about. And again, I don't know the answers to these, but I'll give you my sort of... Uh, experienced, educated guesses for some of this. And certainly if I was running a chain again, I would be absolutely spending some money on research to find out these things. And a lot of this is stuff that sometimes regular research doesn't ask. You know, you're talking about music and stations and personalities and all that stuff, and they don't go into other things, which anyway, I'm, we'll touch on in, in the back. But first I want to tell you two stories, okay? And one is about business and it'll make total sense in this environment. Another is personal. It's something that happened to me that had nothing to do with business, but it's more of a lifestyle thing. And I think both stories will be very entertaining for you. So if nothing else, you'll, you'll get probably, you know, get a charge out of, uh, out of hearing the stories. The first story is about the CEO of Raytheon. And Raytheon is a, uh, you know, they make airplane engines, they make bombs, they make uh, you know, a whole bunch of different stuff for, for the industrial military complex, among other things. The CEO was retiring and he put out a book of which he plagiarized, okay, which is a bad thing. And everybody ripped the guy apart for plagiarizing it. But before everybody knew that he plagiarized it, he um, made 300 copies of this book and he sent them around to people, of which one of his friends was Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett Buffett gets the book, he reads through it. Warren Buffett goes, oh my God, this is awesome. And he sends it around to all of his CEOs of all of the companies in Berkshire Hathaway, which are a sizable amount of companies. And they're all really, really successful. And, you know, and Warren's sending it and going, hey, I think you should read this and probably abide by a lot of this. This is really smart stuff. 
So the people at Raython, they're, they're in a meeting and they have three divisions that make something. I, I, I don't remember what it was. Let's just say it's washing machines. And two of them are profitable and they are productive. And the third manufacturing plant, it continually has productivity shortages and you know, it, it you know, barely makes budget or it misses budget or whatever. It's continual and they put a ton of money into it and they get it up to roll a little bit pretty decently and then back down it goes. So this meeting is about how do we fix this plan? So they go round and around and they're doing all the normal things. Well, you know, we can put more workers there. Or we can put some new machinery in. We can do the thing, da, 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 da. And then comes the question, which is the entire purpose of this chapter in the book and why I'm telling you this. Comes the final question. One of the policies of this guy, the CEO who ripped, you know, ripped the book off was ask this question in every meeting. What is the question that we're not asking? The most important question that you can ever ask in a meeting is what are we not asking? I know that sounds like a circle and like, what are you doing here? But the most important question, what the hell is it? What is it here? What are we, what are we not asking? Finally, some guy raises his hand in the back, you know, one of the lowly people, you know, that's in the second rows, so to speak. And he goes, why are we doing washing machines in the first place? Why don't we just blow these businesses off and sell it? Uh, good question. The return on washing machines or whatever that thing was, you know, is okay, but we, wait, we make way more money on airplane engines and all this other stuff. So let's sell these off, take the money and build more of these. So that's what they did. Again, they quit. That's my point of this. They quit making something that was subpar as far as profitability and things. They just got out of it and took their money and repurposed it elsewhere where they could get a bank, better bank for the buck. That's a business thing. Let me give you a personal one. Similar type thing, which again, I think it might probably be pretty, pretty interesting to you. I'm in the army. So uh, I'm in the United States Army. I got to do six years. And it's during the Vietnam War. I didn't go to Vietnam, so I'm not you know, playing that card or something. I stayed in the United States the whole time. But so you, you know, when you're in the Army or actually any of the armed forces, you have to go to basic training and they cut it into two pieces. One is basic training where they teach you how to throw grenades, you know, sh shoot a rifle, you know, how to stand in formation, you know, and, uh, you know, and march and all of that type of stuff. How to use a gas mask, how to breathe when you take the bas gas mask off, you know, all of those things and that type of stuff. That's basic training and it's eight weeks. And then after that, you go for another eight to 10 weeks in whatever your specialty is. And they call that a MOS, a military occupational specialty. So that's the second heart, the second half of basic training. But this is about the first half of basic training. So I get there and the first thing they do is they line everybody up for squad leaders, the tallest to the shortest. I'm a little hair under six, five, because I'm like six, four and a half, six, five, depending on what shoes I'm wearing. So I'm right at the front. So you're a squad leader. Great. Okay, cool. Now what that entailed is they had barracks of which, you know, I'm sure you picture. Okay. These are the barracks and they have two floors. It's a floor upstairs and the floor downstairs. Each had their own bathrooms and the bedding inside and all that sort of stuff. And I'm now responsible for the top floor of one of these barracks because all the guys in there, they're mine. At the end of the week, they have this inspection and this is where, you know, just like you see in the movies, you know, you're out with a toothbrush and you're, you know, be, you know, underneath the toilet bowl, you know, right where it meets the tile of the floor and you're trying to clean it and you're trying to get everything spotless. You're literally pulling on the block blankets of your, of your bed to get them so tight across that the drill instructor, when they come around, they'll drop a quarter or a half a dollar onto the bed and it had better bounce a certain height. Otherwise, you know, you've done it wrong. So every weekend when there was less training, uh, sometimes you could you sort of get a little bit of a break on the weekend. You'd have to clean the barracks and have them super spiffy, be, you know, and they come around with an inspection and everybody, all the squads would compete to see who would be first and who would be last, you know, and you know, all of that, you know, and everybody would laugh at the ones at the bottom. The point is at the four week mark, Okay. And again, there are eight weeks of this at the four week mark. When we'd done a month, we were allowed to actually go on leave for the weekend. And then this is where it became really important to be the number one, um, cleaner upper squad, because 
whoever came in first of the eight squads, they got to leave the barracks first. They could, you know, you know, get suited up. They could go down to the bus station. They could go into Trenton, New Jersey or Philly, uh, Philadelphia, which was pretty close. I, I was at Fort Dix, New Jersey, um, and Philadelphia is pretty close. Trenton is even closer. So you catch the bus and you'd go in. You'd go, you'd stay three, four hours and you'd come back to the base because, yeah, you know, you got army duds on. You look sort of stupid. And if you don't have army duds, you know, your hair is shaved. So you also look stupid. <laughs> you, know, you just don't want, you don't want to be there. So... Again, you know, everybody's trying for that first week, uh, you know, well, we, we can leave early. And then, um, so the inspection's over, here's the winners, and then everybody now goes and actually starts using the stuff where you'd go into the shower and you'd clean up and you'd, you know, you'd put away your army duds, you'd put on, you know, your, your actual, you know, st normal civilian street clothes, and, you know, a bunch of guys would get together and you'd walk down to the bus station if you were going to take a bus, and actually most of the people just actually stayed in the barracks, they didn't really go anywhere. But for the third even who left and would go down to the bus station, of which I was one of them because I wanted to go home, I'm sitting there and all of a sudden this is what struck me. I get to the bus station and the guys who came in first, they're there, they're sitting there. So now I'm sitting in the chairs right next to the guys who left, you know, before me. But even then they only left maybe 10 minutes before me because everybody had to, you know, take a shower and all that sort of stuff. And we're all waiting essentially for the same buses. You know, the buses for, for Philly, the buses for Trenton, and the buses for New York City where I was going, they're all roughly leaving at seven o'clock. So all of a sudden, the people who killed themselves to come in first and second, and third, and fourth, and along the way, all of those squads got nothing out of it. Because the whole thing was, you could leave first. Well, big deal. You're sitting in a chair waiting for a bus, and everybody's bus leaves at 7 o'clock. You got zero out of it. So I'm looking at this and going, huh, this is kind of interesting. So when I got back, you know, uh, on Sunday night, I sat everybody down, all, you know, all the, the people in my squad upstairs, and I said, hey, you know, this is what I noticed, guys. Um, do you want to do this or not? I think we should do this. And they're like, what? Okay, well, I explained the whole thing like I just explained to you. And, and I said, I think we should not care. I mean, we're not going to do a horrible job so that, you know, we, we look like idiots. But I don't care if we come in first. Let's not try to win. And everybody went, yeah, okay, sure. Why not? because they understood what I was saying. So that's what we did on the next one. And sure enough, we came in dead last and the next week dead last, and then the next week dead last. And, you know, and then the basic training was over. And, you know, we're the laughing stock. Oh my God, you suck. Oh yeah, you guys are a joke. But we were good on everything else. You know, like pretty much the entire squad could sh shoot expert as at rifle and knew how to throw the can grenades. Nobody did anything stupid. The army part, everybody had down, not a problem. Just this cleaning of the barracks. You know, we always came in last. And then the last week, that we were doing this, you know, somebody was ribbing us, and I actually told one of the other people, you know, other squad leaders, that we this is what we were doing. And I explained why, and the person kind of looked at me, and you know, I gotta tell you, there really is an expression on someone's face when someone realizes how stupid they are. You can see it clear as a bell, because he's like, oh, man, okay. So it's graduation day and, you know, everything's done. And from here on out, we're going to go on to learn your actual skill in the army. So basic is done. And the drill sergeant comes up to me and he goes, hey, I heard from so-and-so of what you guys were doing. And I go, oh man, here it comes. Okay, this ought to probably not be good. And I go, yeah. He goes, so how did you get everybody to do that? And I said, well, I just sort of explained it to them. I told them why. I told them, you know, the whole thing. And I said, hey, you guys decide. Whatever you guys want to do, that's what I'll do. And he goes, you just asked them? That's it? I go, yeah, I just asked them. I explained it to them. I showed them the good, you know, the good part and the bad part. You know, we're going to be made fun of, but we don't have to kill ourselves. And everybody wanted to go along with it. And he looked at me and he goes, wow, okay. And he laughed a little bit. And then he said it again. You see, you just asked him. I go, yeah, I just asked him. And he, huh. And he walked away. His job is to mold people and to get you to think 
and you know to you know to be able to to assess the situation and you know and and you know adapt i mean that's kind of the marine's motto you know adapt and overcome and there's something else along in there but he was fine with it and then the guys inside were fine with it so i wanted to point that out because that has you know nothing to do with uh radio but it has everything to do with quitting the game and that's where i kind of where i'm going with this i quit the game we quit the game that they were playing now that we had that out of the way let's go back to the edison research study and uh, let's go through this and pick out some things that sort of come to mind things that possibly you as a listener or you as a pd certainly i would have that as i listen to radio now that maybe is bugging you and you go like ah, i think this is wrong and then you look at you know this research and you go like huh all right well looks like the numbers maybe are bearing that out things like that things that also you're not looking for at all and you go "Ooh, that's a complete surprise why is that so I kind of, to me, as I went through this research, uh, you know, and I don't know if this is 100% correct, but I mean, you know, there's a lot of experience and educated guesses behind, you know, me having so much um, time in the business. I came up, uh, came up on like nine different things that I think might be causing these numbers, you know, these things here to go up and down. And so let's just start going through them. Number one, and let me show you this. This is a Pew Research Study on Religion, <laughs> and you're going, what do you show me a religious thing for? And this is a religion of people, you know, around the world, and as you can see from, you know, from the, uh, from the research, you know, Mexico is on top with uh, 71% of the people are, you know, are very happy, and they're very religious, and then it goes down to Belarus, which is on the bottom, which basically has, <laughs> obviously, no religion at all. Uh, actually, surprisingly, Spain is sort of on the bottom there, too. And, you know, being a Spanish country, you'd think that would be higher, but, uh, but it's not. Anyway, so why am I showing you this? Well, because there's a University of Michigan study that's put out every single year, and they've been doing it for 50, 60, maybe 100 years, I don't know. And it goes like this. What the research study is, it's a snapshot of the state of the nation, the United States, uh, every single year is how people are feeling about themselves and how people are feeling about the future. Uh, so... Um, you know, if, if things are going bad, if there's a recession, if there's a depression, if there's COVID and they can't go out, if there's a chance of war or you're in war, or all of those type of things, it's going to skew people one way or the other. Does it make them apprehensive and, you know, nervous about the future and where they are in the world at the moment? Or, you know, does it make them, uh, you know, feel happy because, you know, none of that is going on. They have a great job. They got money in the bank. They're getting ahead in life. You know, they maybe had new kids and they're thrilled and all that sort of stuff. So it's a snapshot of that. But here's where it gets interesting because, and, you know, and you'll see how this enters into this uh, as I throw back this back up on the screen and just stare at this for a second. Take a look at where... Um, the stations that are doing really well, where they are. Classic Rock, Gold, Classic Hits, Gold, Classical, Gold, probably <laughs> probably the ultimate gold station. You know, they don't go back, you know, just a few decades. They go back centuries. And, you know, even Urban Adult Contemporary, which is primarily gold and certainly AC stations, have a, you know, a heavy amount of gold. And also in here is Contemporary Christian which goes along with this religious thing I'm showing you. So now let me explain the University of Michigan study. What they found out of that, because I, I delved d deeply into this you know, around 30 years ago when I first noticed it, you know, because I was, you know, running stations in Michigan. When people are apprehensive and they're nervous and whatever, their mind goes toward safety and they go toward the past because they know from a safety point of view that they've got through the past. They're still here. They're still standing. Everything's good. The future can look scary depending on the situation that you're in, okay? And right now, probably, for a lot of people, the future is scary or, at, at the, at, in a good way, iffy, for sure. So the past looks way nicer. And when you like the past and feel good about the past, musically, I guess, they didn't have the music in this study, but you know, people embrace everything of the past, I would assume music and radio stations playing from the past would be, you know, among that, uh, those things. And so what this means is there's a huge trend going on there. And that trend has probably been going easily for the past 10 years because, you know, the United States, certainly politically alone, has been super amount of turmoil. 
and then, you know, for, for two years of this study, COVID. So it's a massive trend. And certainly when you're investing, there's an old adage in the stock market, never ever try to catch a falling knife. And that means don't bet against the trend. If stocks are in a trend upward, do not start saying, I'm going to short the stocks and bet the other way. You'll get killed. Well, when you look at this research and you go like, wow, gold stations through the roof, the Christian station up 49%. Wow, that is pretty remarkable. So let's go to another one. Young people are leaving radio in droves and they're going to something else. Now that really wasn't but a possibility, you know, probably before 2010, 2011, when Spotify started to kick in and, you know, they didn't start really getting stronger It took them, you know, years to get rolling. And now, you know, they're streaming everywhere. So there's a lot of different options right now, where if you go back 10 years, there were less options. Certainly people could listen to music outside of radio, but there were less of them and it was hard to tell. But now, now you look down and you go like maybe just flat out young people, they're pretty much generally speaking gone and they are not coming back. The game has changed radically. And that brings us to number three. What if current music is a young person's game only or mainly at least mainly. And let me go through some, some numbers for you to let you think a little bit more of that. The average age of a woman nowadays, it used to be way younger, it used to be 21, then it moved to like 24, now it's 26 for a woman to have their first baby. For a guy, it's moved pretty quickly from like age 25 to now it is uh, 31. Wow, yeah, that's a pretty big jump in just a couple of years, probably because more guys are staying at home and jobs and all of that other stuff. But suffice to say that when you have a baby at the age of 26 for a woman and 31 for a guy, at that point, your life changes pretty dramatically. For the next four or five years, for sure, your entire life is centered, you know, on your new baby, your new child. And, and if you really were into going out to clubs and really liking, you know, current music and finding out about the artists and all that stuff, that is definitely going to take a back seat. You're probably not super into current music. And, you know, when you look at the ratings and you look at these stations, you go like, oh, okay, well, that sort of bears it out. Although I don't really super see demos here. You're guessing on the demos of these radio stations, you know, knowing just simply what the formats are. This is going to be a tough one to say, but I'm going to say it out loud anyway. And I'm going to say it because there's so many young people, younger, okay, under the age of 30, listening to stations based in the 70s and 80s. And you go like, wow, why is that? These people are listening. What is that? That's like 30, 40 years underneath their, you know, underneath in theory, what they should be listening to, but they're not, they're going, you know, into the seventies and eighties, classic hits, classic rock and, you know, gold stations and all of that stuff. And, and including a lot of AC stations that pull, you know, pretty strong 18 to 34 numbers. Why is that? Well, I, I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there because I think it's a definite possibility, at least to my ear, that, that generally speaking, certainly there's great songs now, but generally speaking, current music just isn't good as an overall. The, there's not a whole lot of musicianship going on right now. Like I don't, you don't hear drummers going off on riffs, cool riffs in between songs, like the, you know, the amazing session players or just flat out musicians of bands from yesteryear. You don't hear different instrumentation. Like as an example, the Beatles, the Beatles probably along the way, you know, with oboes and violins and, you know, and different kind of strings and, you know, and horns. Uh, you know, all you need is love with the horn, da, 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 you know, all of that stuff. You don't hear any of that stuff anymore. It's all kind of the same sound. So, you know, the genres of music have really, they may be there, but man, they have really tightened up. So there's a whole lot of sameness. There's a whole lot of copying. It's a question that you kind of have to ask here, maybe why current music stations are tumbling. I was going to say falling, but man, they're tumbling. Maybe the reason is because current music sucks overall. They just don't have enough to pick from to actually hold the radio station up. Perhaps these formats are way too restrictive in this day and age. Um, you know, it's been for years now, you know, probably the last couple of decades easily. Uh, it's been the, 
you know, the right thing to do, the best practices to have a very, very tight playlist. But, you know, if you can remember it, I'm all old, so I can, and you know what, what was going on. If you go back to the 60s, and you go back to the 70s and the 80s, and a pretty decent chunk of the 90s, there was a lot of different genres of music on the radio, and they would be played by, you know, by a station. Um, there were certainly different formats, but every one of them was a lot wider than it is right now. Just take a typical classic rock radio station right now that's playing songs out of the 70s and 80s. Let's go through that for just a second. If, you know, they're going to be playing rock, right? So, okay, well, it's one format. That's pretty, you know, slim. Well, not really. Because back then and even now, you can hear Metallica, Ozzy, Beatles, Stones, Billy Joel on some stations, and certainly back then, you know, Billy Joel would have been played song like uh, You May Be Right. I mean, that's a rockin' song. Um, it's still rock and roll to me. That would have been played on, you know, on rock stations back then. And let's just keep going. Seeger, Arlo Guthrie was on rock stations back then. Arlo Guthrie, I mean, that's a folk song. You know, pretty cool one. Seven minutes, as I recall, maybe eight minutes. Uh, that's when everybody took a bathroom break. But but still, it, it, you know, Arlo Guthrie was played folk. You'd never get that now. Super Tramp. Super Tramp was different, certainly. Pink Floyd, Zeppelin, Bowie, Elton, Deep Purple, Boston, Aerosmith, Police, Peter Gabriel. I mean, these are different kinds of sounds that you don't hear now spread out on one type of format. So from a hit versus non-hit perspective, classic hits and classic uh, rock stations, they're, they're an all-hit radio station, just like what a CHR is supposed to be. But CHR has a hard time being that, I think, in this day and age. Here's something else that sticks out. You take a look at urban contemporary R&B and urban contemporary hip-hop R&B. They're both growing 6%, 5% up, but they're their opposites, rhythmic CHR and pop CHR, they're down a huge amount. It's like somebody just jumped out of an airplane with the format and they don't have a parachute on. Are stations overassuming the demand for R&B, urban and hip hop and black music just generally? Is there not quite as much demand for it as what, you know, you know white stations, if you will, think that there is? Another way of looking at this is, is it possible that a black audience really feels no need to leave black radio stations that are pur purposely built and embrace a black audience. Seriously, when you think about it, why would they leave? It doesn't happen reverse very much. Maybe it's the same ratios of audience both ways. If that's the case, then what's the point in this day and age of actually having a rhythmic CHR format? Yes, some of them might be, you know, doing okay, but but if you look at this, the majority are, you know, getting decimated. So, you know, maybe it's just, just as simple as you're playing, you know, a ton of black music and you're sort of like an urban radio station. But, you know, if you're the black audience, you want to actually listen to the urban radio station. They don't want to listen to you. Or this is possible too. You know, when I listen to an rhythmic CHR and you look at the playlist and stuff, I mean, I get the impression there's somewhere between 85 and 95% of playing, you know, black music, you know, uh, and again, nothing wrong with black music. I love, I love R&B. I love black music. I've, you know, played it and programmed it all my life and leaned into it. So it's not that, but but as I've been telling you in this course, ratios and how you play things along with errors and all that other stuff, it, it, it has a huge bearing on how your station sounds. Maybe, you know, for a rhythmic CHR versus a real urban contemporary radio station, you know, that is expected to do, you know, 100% black music or 95 or 98, maybe you can't get away with it because the ratio is just too high. Again, because maybe the black audience isn't going to come or it's simply the ratio is too high. Same thing with maybe a pop CHR. Maybe you can't push into the 50, 60, 70 percent range, which a lot of times stations move into that amount of ratio of black music because it's just not expected. I don't know if this is 100% in play, but of the things that I'm going through, all or some, or maybe one major one, absolutely can be in play here, why these numbers look the way they do. Let's move on. Perhaps it's not the music at all. Perhaps it's how it's played. Again, that goes to the ratios that I was just talking about. But let me throw this thing out to you. Uh, I, I have a, uh, I don't know, student, uh, certainly a, a, somebody who watches these lessons. Um, and he's in California. His name is Alex. And um, he's helped out on this particular lesson uh, big time for me because he opened up something. I was like, wow, 
That's startling. I, I, it really surprised me. So Alex is, he's a PD of a couple Spanish stations in California and a few Spanish stations in Mexico. He does Spanish contemporary radio stations. So when you look on here, Spanish contemporary, it's up 17%. 17%, that's a pretty high jump. As I was talking to, um, you know, email back and forth with Alex, uh, I said, uh, you know, I'm not 100% sure of Spanish stations, you know, how they're comprised, how they're made up and stuff. I, you know, I listen to them more and more in Orlando, but, I, you know, I, I, I can't tell... I, I don't have enough history with them. My guess is that Spanish contemporary is pretty much like, you know, regular CHR, pop CHR. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Except that you're playing Spanish music. It's the Spanish hits. Okay, cool. And adult Spanish, which is on here too, as you can see, which is at a zero Spanish adult hits. I said, is that pretty much like, you know, an, a non-Spanish a, you know, adult hit station? Yes, it is. Okay, cool. So when you look at this and you go, Spanish Contemporary is up 17%. Pop Contemporary Hit Radio, CHR, down 33%. You put those two together, 17 up, 33 down, that's a swing of 50%. 50%. So, you know, just hold that to thought because those are massive swings. So let me just go through this as you're staring at, you know, at these numbers. If you look at Spanish stations, they're climbing, obviously, but this is what was interesting from what he told me. Their current power rotations are around two and a half to three hours. Non-Spanish CHRs are one and a half to two hours. Pop CHRs are almost double the speed of a Spanish CHR. If you take the Spanish up and double that 17 in 17, you put them together, that's 34. You pretty much get the 33 drop of the pop CHR. It's a quite a startling mirror, really, of one to the other. Is it the rotations? Because, you know, if this was stock trading, this would be a super strong warning light because they look for mirrors and technical anal analysis all the time. What's mirroring something else that's related? And this is for sure related. Now, it quite possibly could be too that in Spanish markets, because they're not everywhere, um, the Sp Spanish population is growing, could definitely be that. But it also could be these rotations, which are uh, pretty amazing. Also, uh, he sent, I didn't ask, but he sent uh, this along for TSL. The typical time spent listening of a Spanish CHR, again, with two and a half to three hour power rotations, is roughly three and a half to four hours. That's the weekly time spent listening. Tracy Johnson just had a thing in his blog a couple days ago that now the typical time spent listening of a CHR today, a non-Spanish CHR, is around 45 minutes a week. 45 minutes versus three and a half to four hours, you're into the four and five times more time spent listening. You change your time spent listening that much and can hold your cue, and you got some major jumps in your ratings or if it goes the other way, you got some major drops going on in your ratings. Lastly, let's go to the last two items on this list, and I'm going to kind of combine them because they really have to do with content on a radio station. And this would be certainly music, but I'm going to go beyond the music and I'm going to go to the air talent. Um, because I've been looking at podcasting, certainly because of doing this, you know, I, I get more and more interested in it because essentially I'm kind of in that podcasting realm, except we're doing video on YouTube. And YouTube is really super growing in visual podcasting. It's huge right now. But anyway, just in podcasting, you know, you have to ask the question of content. What are you serving up? Is it is it worthwhile for somebody to view or is it worthwhile for somebody to listen to? And that comes around to the content of a radio station. So when you see these stations dropping down, you have to ask the question kind of in an overall, really, if radio at this moment had to go to a subscription service and could no longer do commercials, would anybody pay to listen to your radio station? Is your music better than Spotify or any streaming service? Well, probably not. So what's left that somebody's gonna wanna pay for? Now take a look at this. This is research from Signal Hill Research. They, they did this with Cumulus. Some of these were done with Triton. Which one of the following features, if any, would influence your decision to pay for podcasts the most? Exclusive original content is the big one. 35, 37, 35 over the past three years. You can see an ad-free experience is dropping down and being able to access the person who is making that content 
you know, that's reasonably, you know, strong there at 13% too. So you can see that content is a big deal. Content's a really big deal. And do you have people serving content up? That's worthwhile, that somebody would pay for. Because I think that might have to be the thinking at this point. Let's go to another slide. Which types of podcasts do you like to listen to on a regular basis, okay? And you look through and they're different for, for men and women, and you know, and that's obvious. But this is what caught my eye. Look from the bottom up, fifth from the bottom. Music, 17% for a woman. I thought that was incredibly small. I was like shocked to see that actually. It's like, wow. But then look at the men, the men are 28%. But for either one of them, they're, you know, they're lower on the totem pole. I totally understand where, you know, we're, I'm, I'm maybe doing apples and oranges podcasts, you know, to regular radio, although, you know, it is audio to audio and it is interest level of something to spend their time. Because at the end of the day, that's the business that we're in, time. It's not all this other stuff. I told you that on many other lessons. Our business is just to make somebody spend their time with us. So depending on your format, if music is a problem, you need to change your content and get better content. And the only people that really are going to be able to do that are your air talent. You're going to either have to get better air talent or simply open them up and hopefully you have pretty good air talent already. You just need to let them be a talent and entertain. A lot to think about here. I'm seemingly a kind of a fairly simple research, uh, you know, research one slide thing. There can be a whole lot of stuff going on as obviously we just went through. Hope you liked the lesson. Hope you got something out of it. Hope uh, overwhelmingly it made you think about radio in a different way or just think about it, period. Because sometimes, you know, you're on the treadmill and you're running so fast that you don't get a really a chance to kind of go up and look down and go 30,000 feet. What's going on here? Uh, hopefully I kind of, you know, at least pointed your mind in some different directions to start thinking that way, because that is what a PD does. If you like these lessons, don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button and all that good stuff. And I will see you on the next lesson. See ya!